Hey, I'm Scott. This is my buddy Kyle. This is my buddy Scott. I'm right together again. And uh, we're getting ready for camp. We've got a couple of pews out here. You guys are so far away this morning, but uh, we'll feel close here as we dive into today's message. So yeah, summer camp, uh, you saw there uh, just a great time. I just want to reiterate how amazing summer camp was, how amazing summer camp is. The next few days here at our kids camp are going to be the highlight of some of this summer that we have. Oh, we love it. I know I always look forward to it. I know for a lot of our families, even students, uh, we circle that date on the calendar first thing because we look forward to our summer camps and we have winter camps as well that we do throughout the year. Um, just such a blast for students to go up. Uh, they love even getting on that bus full of 50 some other students <laughs> stinking all the way up to yeah. uh, camp destination. Uh, it's worth it. It's, we, we do fundraising, we put in time, effort, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and it's always worth it. I know it's a lot of work um, logistically and all that kind of stuff, but arriving at camp is literally like no other experience, and our students enjoy it. I still get that feeling when I drive up there, get out, and get everything unloaded. It's a blast. We and, love arriving at summer camp. And this last week, you guys at, at Fusion on Wednesday night had students share their stories of what yes. God did. My son, who's going into sixth grade, was just a little bit nervous about summer camp and the whole the whole experience. But he came away from Fusion last week just going, uh, that was awesome. Like, he he literally is using, like, adult words. He's like, my heart was refreshed, Mom. Like, <laughs> what? who are you? You're, like, 11. But <laughs> as he heard people share how awesome camp was. He was yeah. just inspired, encouraged, like God's at work. Like he was really using some adult stuff yeah. there. And, and he's saw, excited for winter camp. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You saw even in the um, every minute there, we got camp coming up this weekend. Our, our leaders for kids camp are going to be here tonight. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that. But arriving at camp is amazing. And, and we love to arrive at the destination, right? I think back, summer always reminds me of camp and all the craziness of summer, but also makes me think of my anniversary. That's I got married uh, nine years and 12 days ago. Uh, it's summer camp is always right around my anniversary, so I always celebrate my anniversary with my wife and 50 other youth students. And uh, we, uh, I remember eight years ago on our first wedding anniversary, we took a trip to Lake Chelan. And we're going to take a road trip together, and uh, we were excited to go on our first kind of, you know, big celebratory trip. And uh, we were both working, so we got off and, and started our road trip that night. And uh, we're super excited about getting to Lake Chelan. Had never been, so didn't know how to get there. And this was eight years ago before your iPhone told you everything that you need to know about the world. And uh, so we didn't have directions. Remember those days we used to print off oh, directions? Map quest, Map couple quest. pages. You're like, where do I go yeah. now? How about this? We had to write them down, like go two miles, turn left at the sign. So we didn't have an iPhone, but what we did have was uh, my trusty pal, Tom Tom. He was my GPS in my car uh, that I thought was amazing, and I thought he would he was my trusty steed, if you will, to get us to Lake Slam. Little did I know that Tom Tom was a moron. Was wrong, wrong. It was wrong, wrong. So we start off on a trip. I know the general vicinity of how to get to Lake Chelan, but I don't know specifics. So I type it in to Tom Tom, my pal, thinking he's going to help me out. And uh, we start getting there. We're great. We're on the freeway. We're going the right direction. And then Tom Tom's like, here, you exit here. I'm like, okay, that sounds great. And then it starts getting a little sketchy. Like, okay, go towards this farmland over here that nothing else is around. I'm like, Tom Tom knows best. He's going to take us on a shortcut. We're going to get there way quicker. It's going to be a blast. And then literally, these are the directions. Turn right on road G. Road G, it's like a dirt farm road, right? Like this does not belong to anybody other than that farmer to get to like other areas of his land. But Tom Tom knows about this road, so it's got to be legit. So we get on this dirt road and my wife is like, no, this is not happening. I'm like, hey, Tom Tom knows best. No, he doesn't. And so... We're going down this road, and then that's when I see, like, the no trespassing sign, which in and of itself is sketchy, but this one has bullet holes through it. <laughs> so it's like, okay, this is not a good idea. And I'm like, I got to turn around, but it's a one-lane little dirt road. So then we get to the cliff. Like, no lie, there's a cliff. It's just like, I'm, like, thinking Thelma and Louise style, just going. Like, that's where this, that's where Tom Tom led us. So I have to turn around. I literally have to do, like, a 27-point turn, get out of there. Uh, we find a little town with a restaurant that's closed down because it's late at night. I'm like, do you know how to get to Lake Chelan? Just point me in the right direction. And we finally get to the, we finally get on the right road. We finally get to Lake Chelan. We pull into our hotel. And it was, like, that arrival, right? Like, a deep breath of relief. Like, we made it. And uh, I remember lots about that vacation, but arriving, right, and the destination made it all worth it. And being able to hang out with my beautiful wife and celebrate our, uh, our marriage and hang out together was great. 
And as much as I remember that trip and the craziness of Tom Tom, I really remember arriving, and, and, and I think the arrival makes those those trips worth it, and it makes it what it wants to be. And you guys didn't want to give up because you, the destination was worth yeah. it, getting on to your vacation. And we had a similar story with, with a vacation six years ago that we took where we were headed to Lake Shasta to celebrate with our extended family, my mom's side of the family, because her mom, my grandma, had passed away, and grandma was all about getting all the family together. She had a large extended family. She was always about including people and hanging out. And so every year we made a point of getting together. And she was the matriarch of the family. But then when she passed, uh, we thought, well, what, what would grandma want? Well, she wouldn't want us just having a, like a service and sitting around being sad and crying. She would want us to go on vacation. And then we thought, well, grandma should probably pay for it too. So she paid for it. Thanks, grandma. It was so great. So grandma rented us two houseboats at Lake Shasta and everybody from around traveled there and uh, as as we were leaving here we have a minivan we have seven seats we got five people in our on our family and so i was like seven minus five is two so i was like mom and dad you guys just want to ride in our minivan together it'd be great we'll save on gas money it'd be like bonding time genius genius can't go wrong and uh because it's going to be worth it like getting to the lake the houseboat the jet ski the wakeboarding uh the food the family having a memorial there in a nearby area for grandma it's going to be beautiful and so we all pile into the van. We got, my dad has a utility trailer, a small one. We put all of the food, because you had to pack a week's worth of food for a lot of people. We had all the ski gear, all of our clothes, and then everybody in the van. So we just had a full load of people, and we're set out on this 600-mile trip, two-day trip, and we get to the Sprague Lake, and the axle blows on the trailer. <laughs> and it's the 4th of July, and nothing's open, and it's hot out. And we're in the middle of nowhere, right? Like in between, you know, here and nowhere. And so we're like, ah, oh, what do we do? We just got started. We're 45 minutes into the trip. It's like, well, we got to keep going. We got to figure it out. And a couple hours later, we finally, we know somebody in Ritzville. They let us borrow their trailer where we just let them like have our broken trailer and they fixed it. And it was why we were gone. And, but it was one of those things we roll in late that day to bend and then on the next day. But it's totally worth the destination. We weren't going to turn around at Sprague Lake. We weren't going to give up on it. We like encountered some conflict in our travel, but we weren't going to quit on it because it was going to be worth the hard work and whatever it took to get to where we wanted. We want to arrive at the best destination possible. And Kyle and I have been working together. You actually, right after you got married, then you started here. Yes. So nine years ago. And I, I got hired like the month before. So we've been working together uh, for the last nine years here. And uh, we've had plenty of times in our relationship to decide, are we going to try to arrive at the best destination, or are two hard-headedness, egoness driven people going to, you know, create conflict and then continue in the conflict? Because just like both of those trips, right, we want to arrive at the best destination. We also want to do that in our relationships. We want to get to a point where we're arriving at the best destination relationally, and that's what we've been talking about in this series. How can we do that together? And the, the way to do that is to resolve conflict. So for the last two weeks, if you haven't been with us, this is our third week, final week. All of our messages are available online for free and uh, on our app as well. But resolving conflict, because here's, here's the risk we run. Unresolved conflict will destroy a relationship. It's not going to destroy it immediately, per se. I mean, some of the extreme cases may be yes right away. But unresolved conflict, you run the risk of destroying the relationship by creating distance and separation between the parties involved. And you may not even realize it because you're like, oh, it's not that big a deal, not that big a deal. And then think back and you're like, well, whatever happened to so-and-so? Why aren't we so close? And whatever happened with so-and-so? And why weren't we so close? Like there might be some unresolved conflict that just over time has created separation and distance. And then you had more conflict and it wasn't dealt with and it was unresolved. And you just have more and more separation. It's not the best way to live. Your creator, God, your heavenly father, like designed us for relationship and for harmony and for, for relationship to have peace. Because what does the world really need? More conflict makers? Like, does the world need more this guy against that guy? This party versus that party? You're on the right, I'm on the left. No, he's in the middle. Like, does the world need more of this nation versus that nation? You're touching my borders. You're influencing our people group. Like, we need this group of nations versus that group of nation. Does the world need more people just on the media saying, I'm against this person and that person's against this person? You know, vote for me, vote for that person. Like, what does the world really need? The more more wall makers, more division creators. No, the world needs more peacemakers. The world needs people who are going to bri uh, build bridges between two groups of people that are in conflict to help out. And as a Jesus follower, as a disciple of Jesus, Jesus says, here's, it's not even really optional. As a Jesus follower, it's mandatory. Like, be a peacemaker. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. You'll be called children of God. And so as a Jesus follower, man, my job and my mission should be resolve the conflict to be a peacemaker. Yeah, because unfortunately what we understand and what we realize is that conflict comes way too easy. Really? Right? It's easy to be involved in conflict. It's easy to stand up for what, you, uh, what you're against for somebody else and all that kind of stuff. Peace is the thing that tends to come a little harder for us to work at being people who are making peace, not making conflict. And if you've been with us uh, for the last few weeks, we've been sharing Romans 12. It's kind of a theme verse for us as we understand how we can deal with conflict and how we can, again, be the people who are making peace. It simply says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That, that God calls us to do our part, that we have to work hard to live at peace with everyone, right? Again, conflict is easy, so we need to work at it, be a people who are working to make peace, create peace in our relationships, in our world. God has that desire for his relationship with us, and then he calls us to live at peace with, with everybody who we're in conflict with or who we're in relationship with. So how do we arrive at that destination? How do we arrive in that place? How do we deal with conflict? Well, we've come up with this for you. Start, drive, and arrive. That we have to start somewhere. That we have to drive and move the conflict uh, conflict or, or the relationship somewhere. And that, that there is, again, like we said at the very beginning, there is an arrival point that we want to get to that best destination. Yeah, so the first thing to do in actually resolving conflict is to st actually start. Like, we actually, you have to bring it up and talk about it and address it and know that there's something to resolve. And one of the hangups, I think, for some of us in addressing the conflict with people that we've been in conflict with before, we've been in a relationship with them, is just, just this idea of like, you know what? I don't even want to bring it up because I know how this is going to go. And the way it leads me is to a dead end. Like, we've had this conversation before. I've been down this road. It just creates more drama and more conflict. It kind of adds fuel to the fire, and it ends in this dead road. So I don't want to go down there again. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste any more, more emotional energy on this. Or we encounter a conflict where it's similar to something else we've had before, and like, I don't even know this person, but I kind of feel how this conversation's going to go, and I just know it's not going to end up anywhere good. It's just a dead end. So that really can be a, a barrier from us actually getting started in addressing the conflict. Well, here's the, 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 the thing that happens with that, is when you say, I, I assume I know where this is going to go, you leave zero room for the other person to have actually changed and grown. You say, there's no possible way you've matured any since we last had this conversation. You can't have any different outcome. And you know, well, yeah, we talked last week about it. Well, yeah, maybe they grew up in the last week. You know, like maybe they were here on a Sunday and they're like, oh, I'm going to do something different now in the approach to my conversation. And here's the deal, too. You run the risk of saying, I know what you're going to say. I know how you're going to respond. I know where this is going to go. You leave zero room for God to actually do anything in someone's heart from the beginning, before you even get started. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to see people mature, people grow. I want to be a person that has matured and grown, right? And I want Kyle in our conflicts to leave room for me to like be different from the last time we had an argument about something. Do you ever run into people in your life and you knew them like 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago and you're still little Scotty to them? You know what I'm saying? They're like, oh, you're still, I remember when you were little Scotty. Like, I'm not little Scotty anymore. Like, that was 25 years ago. Like, I remember when you are just dizzy a little bit. And, and in their mind, you're still like that, that spot. And they haven't, you know, had you grow up and mature. We do that in relationship to one another with conflict. When we say, oh, I know where, you, where, where this is going to go. I know how you're going to respond, Kyle, if I bring that up. Like, I leave no room for him to actually mature. And it's one of those hangups. Because here's the thing. If we actually start with owning our part, like, genuinely, the first thing we do when we start is to own my part in it, my responsibility, even if I feel like it's the micro 0.001% of the conflict. That's a whole different way to start. And the person may have a whole different response then. Because if we come out guns blazing in the conflict, and that's our, our normal approach, and then they get defensive, and then we think, you know, I'm not going to bring it up. They're always defensive. Well, yeah, because you're always attacking them. You know, like if I get attacked, I'm defensive too. And so to come with this approach, wow, that might actually create some change in how we resolve conflict between the two of us. And one of the best ways to figure out what my part is, is to ask the people around me, including your heavenly father, like God's wisdom and insight into your own heart is unbelievable. And into my heart. And we think of prayer usually as this idea of like, okay, God, I'm going to ask you to do something like in me or for me. Like that's what prayer is for most of us. 
But really, God's idea of prayer is this, like an open line of communication where I start with like, God, show me my heart and show me my part I need to own in this conflict. And then just let him speak to me. And he gives us wisdom. He gives us insight. If we take his advice and his way of, of traveling through life, it's the best possible uh, uh, you know, trajectory on arriving at that best possible destination. Yeah. And I love that because a lot of times on the flip side of that, right, it's really easy, like Scott was talking about, we don't allow room for people to grow. On the other side, we're like, well, I grow up, I'm better, I'm not as mad as I was last week, but you, you never change, and so I'm not even going to allow you that, right? When we look in the mirror, we go, I'm, I'm changing, I'm maturing, I'm growing up, I'm not as rude, you know, I'm not, I, I'm growing, but then on the flip side, we're like, well, but Scott probably, he would have, he's the same as he was last year or last week, so I'm not giving him the benefit of the doubt, but for me, I mean, well, obviously, I'm more mature and growing up. So when we flip that around, it, it, we start to understand how we really are from the very beginning driving that wedge deeper into the relationship than is necessary instead of actually starting and then owning our part and how we can help in that. We should probably ask our wives how much more mature we are. Yeah. yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Get Way some better. honest feedback. Way better. <laughs> and then talking about that communication, right? We started with God, but then understanding, uh, and we talked about this last week, that James says it very clearly and very plainly that we would be quick to listen and slow to speak. And this is a little ironic coming from two guys who like to talk a lot and talk over each other and keep communicating and keep talking. But understanding that we've all been a part of those conversations where how much of how boring of a conversation it is when someone just wants to talk and talk and talk and talk, doesn't actually care to hear from you, doesn't actually care to be curious and to listen to what you have to say, and how much more enjoyable it is to be a part of a conversation where you know the other person is curious about you, cares about you, how much better those conversations are. And we can broaden that out to the relationship, how much better the relationship is when when people are communicating communicating and listening and hearing and, and not just about the point that they can make in the relationship or proving who they are in the relationship, but are actually slowing down, listening well, quick to listen, and slow to speak. And so we've just kind of recapped the last couple of weeks with starting and how to be a good driver. And we're going to add today a couple of things on how to arrive at that best possible destination. But I would just ask you this and challenge you with this, like in your resolving conflict, like how well is it going? Like your approach and your method in resolving conflict, like how well is it going? And if it's not going so well, like I would encourage you and challenge you like to, this is not something we're making up. Like this is God's approach, our designer, our creator, and his desire to resolving conflict, to do it this way, to start in the way we've been talking about, to drive in the way we've been talking about. So if you're not getting the results you're wanting, like maybe you would just submit yourself to God's process in resolving conflict and see what happens as his, his way unfolds in your life. And because here's the thing, when we show up to conflict, how to arrive at the best destination happens in really, there's only three, three options I think that are, that are possible and two aren't so great and one's really good, is, is this, to arrive at the best destination through conflict is, is I'm, am I against you? Like that's one way to show up in conflict. I'm aggressive, I'm attacking, I can, you know, it's pretty evident, I'm angry and I'm, I'm like sometimes physically threatening, like I'm against you. Another way is I'm for myself in the conflict. And maybe I'm showing up just to get something out of the, the, the conflict, a resolution for me, like to get Kyle to shut up and just move along in life, right? Like that, I just want that because I just want that. I don't want to hear him anymore and I just want to have him be quiet. So I'm going to show up and resolve the conflict and we'll move along and I just don't have to. But that's just really showing up for myself or showing up in the conflict. The, the, the goal here and the destination to arrive at the best possible destination is to be for him. Am I for you? And to convince the other person that that's true. It's not just for me to think about it and know about it, but like convince the other person through my heart, through my actions, through my words, that I am genuinely for you in this situation. And, and it, this is, Kyle needs to know that. And you're like, well, that's Kyle's job, right? For him to own that or not believe that. You know, like, well, I just showed up. I said I was available to talk and he didn't really want to talk. And so I did my part. Romans 12 says I should do, you know, live at peace as much as it depends on me. Well, I said I was available. I said I could meet on Tuesday and he didn't really want to. He didn't respond. So I guess I'm done. I'm done with my part. I don't think that's what Paul and God are saying in that verse there. Like, it depends on me to convince Kyle that I am for him, because I really am. And then junk gets in the way, kind of skews our thoughts on that. But like, I'm genuinely for Kyle in our relationship. And I'm genuinely for you, and I don't want conflict to show up in that way. Yeah, because we've all been in those, those 
conflict scenarios. And for me, it's, I want to be right. And so when I approach that in a relationship, that's approaching it for me to be for myself. Right. I'm for myself. I might not come at it like I'm against you and I just want, I want to attack you and I want to hurt you. But for me, my bent is I got to prove I'm right because I didn't make a mistake and I'm not doing anything wrong. When I approach even a conflict in that to say, hey, I'm right, that, that's just for me to get something out of it. Me to get my validation or, or to puff up my ego or for whatever it is. So for me to come to a point where I go, I want to approach the relationship because the relationship is the value, I'm for you. I'm approaching this in that way and understanding that to arrive at the best destination relationally, we got to approach even from the very beginning that, hey, I'm for you and I want you to know that I'm for you. I got to put myself aside. I got to put attacking you and tearing your character down aside. And I want you to know and I want to and I want to show that I'm for you. Yeah. And this is some of that really hard work that is worth it in conflict resolution. So quick little illustration to help kind of bring that home, hopefully. Kyle loves to golf, has golfed for many years, golfs very frequently. I started golfing because a couple years ago, my four-year-old, who's now seven, like loved golf for some reason. I don't know. Because he's awesome. You brainwashed him or something. So he's like into golf. So I've started to golf. But people are like, oh, you golf. No, I don't golf. He golfs and I go with him, <laughs> like my kid. And so we, the three of us and another guy, went golfing two weeks ago. And Kyle can just smack the ball straight and like way down the middle. And I'm always on the right side in the woods and the weeds and, you know, finding stuff. And... And it's just like in, in a relationship, if every time Kyle teed off, I'd be like, oh, you suck. That's horrible. That's a little bit off. And I even joke one time. I'm like, yeah, you're three feet off center. You know, like you're one step over. Like you suck. You're like I'm over here in the weeds, you know. But to be for Kyle, like every time he hit a great shot or his golf game is going up, to like cheer for him, saying I'm for you. Your golf game is way better than mine, and I'm okay with it getting even way better than mine. Like... But, but the ninth hole, I was really excited. We teed off. I was like 30 yards behind Kyle. I thought I hit the lottery. It was great, you know? But again, even approaching but that I'll, scenario, for me, as someone who cares more about the relationship, and I got to golf with Scott and his son, it was just a blast. And, and for me to go, hey, well, if I was on my own, I'd play faster, and there'd be less people to worry about, and all that kind of stuff. Hey, I'm for you guys, and I'm for hanging out with you, and I'm for the relationship, and understanding the, the importance of what we do and how we rank that. It's so easy for us to get mixed up and, and focus on things that really aren't important, and focus from the wrong, even starting point for the yeah. relationship. Remember when you had that chip in? I do. On like two? Uh, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. But we just celebrate it. You know, cheer people on. Like, that's how you know if you're for somebody. You're okay with their success, and they're moving, quote, unquote, forward, and you're cheering for them. Like, that's what it really means to be for people. So how do we arrive? What are the new things we're going to add today to arrive at the best possible destination? Well, first of all, pretty practically, we got to fix the problem. And if you're here a few weeks ago, Ben and Angie kind of set up this whole idea with talking about that. With there's, there's issues under the rug that we have to not just sweep under there and leave under there in the dark where they're just going to fester and it's just going to get worse and it's just going to pile up and be a, a tripping hazard for our relationships and for our future. We have to fix the problem. We have to start and get to the place where we're saying, hey, I want to work on this. I, I need to find healing. I need to find wholeness and restoration. And when we hear that, I think our knee-jerk reaction is, yeah, I need to fix the problem, and you're the problem. We have an issue, and you said something, you're the problem, so I need to fix you. You are the problem in this relationship, or this thing that you said, or this thing that you did. I need to fix you as the problem. What we need to focus on is that, man, there's a problem to fix. We don't need to fix the person. I think that's our knee-jerk reaction. Let's, let's work on the relationship and focus, but there is an issue to deal with, but we need to fix the problem, not the person. It's really easy for us to fix blame instead of trying to fix the problem. Well, it's your fault, or it's mostly your fault, so you need to fix what you did. You need to say sorry first, or you need to do this. And again, we're backing up from that approach that I'm for you, and I'm for this relationship, and I'm for arriving at the best destination. In that point, we're just, I'm for being right. I'm for being heard. I'm for being, I'm against you. I'm for myself, and, and we're focusing not enough. Not fixing the problem, not arriving at a healthy relational dynamic, but just being heard or being right or being, you know, you know showing that we know best or, or being against the other person. And we need to start with just, let's fix the problem. Yeah, I think the blame thing shows up real, real evidently. If you walk into a room and you just start with this question, who did this? Like you're genuinely just trying to fix blame. Like there's obviously an issue. There's something broken, something spilled, but you walk in the room and you're like, all right, which one of you did this? Like maybe you're on the, it's easier to see on the receiving end, like a supervisor walks in like, all right, who messed this order up? Like we're just 100% focused on fixing the blame yep. and fixing the person. 
versus trying to actually address the issue at hand. Like, oh, there's a wrong order. We need to correct that, get the right things out to the customer, or there's something on the ground that needs to be cleaned up, so let's clean that up, or this isn't quite the way it should be, so let's fix on, you know, let's get you and you involved and let's fix that issue versus the blame. Yeah. Because that leads us to the second thing uh, is resolving, uh, focusing on reconciliation. To arrive at the best possible destination, you need to focus on reconciliation. Reconciliation is when two people or two groups of people or the parties involved start heading back towards each other relationally. They're becoming more friendly. They're connecting more. They're deepening the relationship. It's becoming more intimate. Because the tension is, well, there's, an, uh, there's a problem. Something broke, something spilled, something got shipped out wrong. It's the th wrong. So we want a resolution. Like, how do I focus on reconciliation when I want a resolution, I want an answer, I want a decision. And we have this tension, like how do you do that? So if Kyle and I are going to lunch and he wants to go to the taco place and I want to go to the Chinese place, right? And we're in, we're in this major conflict over food for, for lunch. It's like tacos, Chinese, Chinese tacos. At some point we just need to make a decision or we just get real hungry, right? And then we're hangry and that adds to it. That's no good. So we got to just decide, is it tacos or is it Chinese? Like we need a resolution, right? And like, well, Scott said reconciliation. like. So we'll go tacos, Kyle. I win. Know, he's kind of a, you know, immature and he throws a fit <laughs> if we go my way. So I'll go your way. Like, I'll be the more mature person. We'll go your way, buddy. And so I don't have to hear you. So then we show up at tacos and he's super happy. He's getting his tacos. And I order something and we sit down and I'm resentful inside. So here we are trying to enjoy each other's company and share a meal together. And he's excited about tacos and then I'm resentful. What, what happens when you're resentful with somebody in, in relationship? Well, it gets cold. It goes distant, you start to separate. And emotionally, right, we're sitting at the same spot physically, but we're gaining distance away from one another. He's smart, and you're smart too. You pick up on that real quick. You're like, oh, something's not right here. There's distance. And then he feels bad because he made me go to tacos, and now we're, he's feeling guilty about making me feel resentful. And so then we're sitting there with, like, good tacos, obviously, but then he feels bad and I feel bad. What kind of resolution is that for a conflict? Well, we made a decision. We got an answer. Yeah, but we just created more distance. And then next time he says, let's go to lunch, I'll be like, nah, I'm good. Why? Because I don't want to be resentful again. And it was about the resolution. And so we don't want to just focus in on the, the, the resolution and getting an answer and resolving it. Well, it's got to be A or B, A or B, A or B. Decide, decide, decide. Like, there's a third option, like focusing on reconciliation. Focus on reconciliation, not the resolution. And that can be so tough right in the midst of it, where you're feeling that, that tension. And we don't, you don't want to turn the other party or parties into just being resentful. Because that's not really for the other person. Like, how am I really for Kyle if I just make him resentful all the time by making a decision? Because reconciliation is to reestablish that relationship and, and, and resolution is trying to resolve every issue. What if today you could just decide and agree that you're not going to agree with someone in your life 100% of the time? Like the goal is not to agree on everything. And I'm talking about your spouse or your close friend or your kid or your parent or a coworker that you have to work with all the time. Like, what if you just decided today that you're not going to have to agree on every issue and you could actually disagree without being a disagreeable person? What if Kyle and I could have unity without being the exact same thing and having uniformity in our relationship? Like, that's possible. You're just not going to agree. I, like, I love my wife, and we agree on a lot of things, and we share a lot of interests. We're just not going to agree on everything in life together, and, and we just got to come to that. So this last week, it was my birthday. Happy birthday, Scott. All right, good, all right. That was my major setup. I was trying to be for myself to illustrate, but if you wanted to have... Anyways, I'm just... So it was my birthday, and we, I took the day off. We're going to Silverwood for my birthday. It's great. It's a ton of fun. And uh, Amy and I had some plans. She got to get, make some lunches and get the kids and stuff. And then I was going to take the dog for a walk and help out and stuff. So I come back from taking the dog for a walk, and I walk into some tension, if you will. And I'm like, what is going on? And there's, there's, an, there's an attitude, you know, and some snarkiness coming from my wife. And I thought, man, it's a birthday morning. It's nice out. I just walked the dog. Like, what is going on in here? And so apparently we had some miscommunication of expectations, understanding how much I was going to be involved with getting ready for the day. And I said, well, isn't walking the dog part of being involved with getting ready for the day? And we talked about that. Well, I thought it wouldn't take that long. It took a couple minutes longer. And so we're in this 
situation, right? And as a guy who's been prepping and talking about this for the last couple of weeks, and it's like fresh, you know, I'm in this moment, and I'm thinking, but I'm a right. And it's your birthday, and so it's you're my birthday. always right on your birthday. Even yeah. if you're wrong, it's Even your birthday, you're so wrong, you're right. You, lady, you just need to say, oh, I'm sorry, honey, you're right 100%, and I, I just, would you forgive me? Like, you know, like, that's what I was looking for. And we have this tension, and she's lovely and kind and beautiful and wonderful, but is just stubborn as the day is long at times, you know? So both of us show up, and nobody's going anywhere at all. And I'm thinking, I'm looking ahead going, this is going to really just be bad day if we have to stand in line next to each other all day long with this, right? You know, just like, that would be horrible. And... And, and my first thought was, and for like 90 seconds, I just thought, I just need her to say I'm right, and then I'll be fine. We'll move along. Like, I just want a resolution. Like, let's just agree I was right about this whole morning thing. And it's my birthday, so let's do it with a good attitude. But then I thought, you know what? What's more important, harmony with my wife or getting her to say I was right? And it's just the grace of God, the mercy of God in that moment, like, had this moment like, okay. Focusing on the relationship and harmony, it, reconciliation, even though it was as small as that was in that moment, right? Reconciliation is more important. The relationship is more important than getting a resolution that she would say. So we just probably just ended up disagreeing on, quote unquote, who was right. But the beautiful thing about that too, is that you begin to focus on reconciliation and the relationship, the need for a resolution, like a decision, an answer, let's fix the blame, like goes way down. And in that case, in my heart, just went away. Like, it just totally went away that morning. Because I'm just going to go, relationship and harmony is way more important. Reconciliation, us moving this direction versus away from one another, is far greater. Yeah. That's arriving at the best destination. And we had a wonderful day at Silverwood. We had a great time with the kids and everybody had great attitudes. And we had fun together all day long. Yeah, because we've all been on the opposite side of that, right? Where we won the argument, but we lost out on relationship. Yeah where we, we, we compromise the relationship, but we won the argument. And we feel good. I won. And if you're anything like me, I'm competitive. I'll play basketball with middle schoolers. I'll throw some elbows. I'm like, I'm beating you. I will win. I don't care if it's pig. I'm not letting you win. I don't let my wife win anything. I'm competitive, right? That's so we want to win. That's true. And we're like, it's happening. I'm winning, right? And sometimes we win the argument and we lose out on relationship. And we've compromised the relationship because we put so much effort on being right or whatever it is. And like Scott said, that we would put the, the relationship as the priority. Not being right, not proving that we have it all together, but that reconciliation would be the priority and that relationships begin to get prioritized over decisions, over who's right, who's wrong, about how it goes, that reconciliation is the purpose. Because it's biblical and it's who God is and, and, and how God created us and really God's plan for all of human existence right. is that God created us as people of reconciliation, that he sent Jesus to be reconciled for us. So where does God want us to arrive at? If we ask that question again in relationship, where does God want us to arrive at? In, in our relationships, in this scenario, in this situation, that we would understand that it's, it's, it's God's heart, that God is a God of reconciliation. He always has been. He reconciled himself to us through Jesus. That God has, that there was this rift of sin that created this gap between us and God, and God fixed it. And that because of sin or, or messes in our relationships, we, we find these gaps in our relationships too. And, and God has a solution for that. This is how Paul put it in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5, verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. That not only is God a God of reconciliation and has dealt with this reconciliation issue between us and him, but that he gives us that mission, that message that, that says, okay, now I want you to be people who are my ambassadors showing what this reconciliation can look like, showing what rifts in relationship can be fixed with God's heart and God's character as he calls us to be people of reconciliation. Reconciliation is the big picture. How we answer that, where does God want us to arrive at? That the relationship and reconciliation are the priorities over being right or solving the problem or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the people that we're in conflict with, we're in conflict with them and we're wanting to start or we're getting started or we're just kind of fumbling our way through how to, you know, be quick to listen and slow to speak. It's because if there are people you love, you care about, you down deep want the best for. Like, that's why you're sticking in it. That's why you're working at it. It's like you're already there, right? 
And for some of you, you're like, I don't know, and I don't want to start. It's really been messy, and it's just there's so much, like, angst and emotion around it, and there's so much history and baggage. Like, they feel the same way, too. Like, you both want the best for each other, down deep. Like, it's just God's place inside of us, that desire. And you want to arrive at the best possible destination. So asking this question, as, as Jesus followers particularly, with this message of reconciliation, that God has reconciled himself to the world through Jesus Christ, Second, or First Timothy 2 says that, says there's one mediator, there's one God, one mediator. Like we were in conf conflict with God, we were in need of reconciliation, and Jesus Christ, God himself, is our reconciler. Like we screwed it up, we are 100% to blame in that one. That we introduced sin into the world and created this distance with God, and God said, I'll fix it. He reconciled us, he didn't fix the blame and point the finger, but by his grace and his mercy... He reconciled us to himself by himself through Jesus Christ. And so as we move forward, just try, like, if you could be encouraged and reminded of that, it's the someone you care about and you love and you're worth fighting for, right? That relationship, you want the best for it. And if, imagine if people just showed up desiring what God wants out of the relationship. If Kyle and I, we have conflict all the time and disagreements and get hurt feelings, but like, if we go, we're with each other and there's this conflict thing over here, we're not against one another, and we're really trying not to be for ourselves in it, but we look at it and go, what does God want, and how do I be for Kyle in this, and what does God want out of this? Like, it puts a whole new emphasis on how we get started in resolving the conflict, and why we should get started as peacemakers, as Jesus followers, as ministers of reconciliation, of this message of reconciliation to the world. Like, we should be people of peace. Yeah. We should not let unresolved conflict lie under the rug of our lives and let it just destroy relationships. And moving forward here, and I know sometimes this can bring up stuff of past relationships, and don't, you don't have to raise your hand on this. Don't we all want to just go back and like apply this to our lives in so many ways? Like all of us. So don't let the shame, don't, let the, don't identify with shame of past mistakes, but moving forward. And even a relationship or a situation where you think, well, that's long gone. That's like long gone, dead, buried. I just think God would say to you this morning, it's not too late to reconcile with people. No. It's never too late to move closer to one another. It may not be in the way or the picture or the ideal that you had in mind or what was possible before, but going forward, reconciliation is possible because I believe with God all things are possible. And I believe that, that people do change. And I don't care what your age is. And you can change, and people around you can change. And I don't care if it was their pattern for 40 or 50 or 60 years. Like, God can change people's heart. The moment we say it's not possible, the moment we say we can't reconcile means you can't change and God can't do anything in you. And I just don't believe that. So I believe for you that there's hope, regardless of the that's past good. and the history. Like, somebody needed that this morning. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So let's make it practical. And we gave you a little cheat sheet in your bulletin that you should have got on your way in. And what are some things that you can begin to do this week? And like Scott just said, I think for some of you in here, the Holy Spirit's already stirring maybe those conversations or those conflicts or those relationships that, hey, I need to come to a place where I want to arrive at the best destination. And how can I do that? And how can I seek um, restoration in that? So again, first, we got to start uh, we got to get the ball rolling. We got to start the trip. We, we can't let fear or we can't let our preconceived notions or our assumptions about where it's going to go or what's going to happen keep us from even starting or our past experiences or whatever. Um, le letting God communicate in us and through us what's necessary for our relationships to get, again, we're not going to arrive at the best possible destination if we never even start down the road. That's right. And then drive. Let's be good drivers. So let's listen and let's speak with reconciliation in mind. Let's not listen and speak with a resolution in mind. Like, I'm just trying to get Kyle to say he was wrong. You know, I'm just like, listen, did he say he was wrong there? You know, like, how do I get it? Like, let me talk and convince you. But like, let's be great drivers and not leave, bad drivers leave relational carnage along the roadway. Great drivers are restoring relationships, building healthy relationships. So let's be good drivers and then let's arrive at that best possible destination. Yeah, then we arrive there with peace. And that we are peacemakers and we arrive there with reconciliation in mind that there is a, a destination like we were talking about, like our summer camp where we get there and it's that breath of release. I've been, I made it. We did it. We're getting to the place that, that we can both understand. I'm for you. Uh, I'm for the relationship and reconciliation is possible. Yeah. 
And so as a Jesus follower, that we would just take this down deep into our hearts and become peacemakers, not conflict makers in our world. And that ultimately, I only can do this and you can only do this because it's the Spirit of God at work in my heart, changing my heart, changing my mind, being renewed in my thinking as I approach conflict and the people I'm in conflict with. And before conflict, like doing the things ahead of time to make sure I'm listening well and understanding that, you know, what people are saying so I don't enter into as much conflict and be a bridge builder and a peacemaker. So it's really God at work inside of us, through us. It's his power giving this, us the desire and the power to do the things that please him. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we acknowledge